1,000 the better stories. You're listening to 1,000 Better Stories, the Scottish Communities Climate Action Network's podcast sharing stories of community-led climate action in Scotland to help us all imagine the better and fairer future and transform what we think is possible. Welcome to our Everyday Changemakers series. We blethers with everyday people taking climate action in their communities. Hello, it's Kashka, your story weaver. For our final interview in the Dumfries-based Everyday Changemaker series, we head to Sandside Community Garden, affectionately known as Apache Land. I spotted it on Google Maps while planning my trip. It was sitting at an edge of the suburb overlooking the riverside meadows below. Two key members of the garden team, Paul and his daughter Chloe, very kindly agreed to meet up early on Monday morning. I enjoyed the morning stroll across town, stopping on the luxurious modern footbridge to admire the calm waters of Neath below, listening to the morning chatter of birds against the distant murmur of busy commuter traffic. After the weekend's rains, the day woke up sunny and crisp. Low light was catching the grey of hoarfrost on the docks among the long grass on the slope leading up to the garden gate, adding a touch of magic to the scene. My hosts were already on site and they welcomed me to the large container shed at the back of the garden plot where we could make ourselves comfortable and grab a cup of tea. Paul's health issues meant that he had trouble speaking clearly so Chloe's helped with the interview. If you're struggling to understand anything as usual, you can also check out the transcript linked in the episode description. I asked them both to introduce themselves and the space. Hello. Hello. It's a beautiful day, cold, but... Do you need a hand with anything? No, you're all right. Hold on by your seat. <sighs> Do you have to walk far? No. Just no, around just the corner. Oh, that's, that's I'm Paul McGregor. Paul McGregor. Chairperson of Sunset Community Garden Project. I'm Chloe McGregor and I'm a community member. Why Apache land? So the Apache land came from back in the day where like that was the name that came to mind because like, it's a patch and it's a land a patch of land that's the way I look at it anyway it's a community, community garden, community space about eight years ago I went to a conference up north at CLB came out and development and I seen people create space growing stuff in the community thought, good idea this, this space was unavailable available at the time, asked the council it was available and We'll talk with Queenie. She is. So we had a big lunch up in the Baldy Park up the top, um, where we mm. organised a big fun, kind of fun day, a picnic in the park where we already came together, and they bought a piece of food from their house, or like a, a recipe they wanted to bring to, to share with everybody in the park. Um, we had like lots of different people. We had like the fire brigade, we had the blood bikes, we had the mm-hmm. community choir, all different kind of things. We had the NHS, lots of different people come together, um, and there was a big massive picnic in the park. That's the start of it. We, had an, we asked the kids what they wanted to see in the yeah. area, and they said, "Oh, we would love to like have a space where we can just come along and like interact and things like that." And this space was a mess when we took over it, so it was just people dumping like old beds and mattresses, things like that. Um, so. We organised a big massive clean up. It's a, it's a nice thing to do yeah, together, yes. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good. And now it, it's it's thriving. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, slowly, getting there slowly. It's nice and tidy, and and it's got lots of you know places to sit down. Yeah. So, is there a favourite spot in the garden that you've got? Really, these bits. We go food. Go food is on time. Share the community. We share. Yeah, we go. We shared out 
the community. Mine's will be like when it is actually done up as like the kids area, because that's my initial plan was to do a kids area for the kids to come along and like have a play and like we're going to put play equipment in, like all natural play equipment like made out of wood and things like that. So once it's all done up, that'll be my favourite part. We've had a lot of kids say to us like, when are we getting this area? So our main focus this year is getting the kids to play area up and running. Like we're looking at like getting costs and things like that. So we're just looking at getting the funding in place for to get that, and then that's what our next task will be. Food and play. What's not to like? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you already said how this came about. What motivated you to actually I make a difference or get I involved think, in that kind of work? I think so. I'm a community person. So why not? Big piece you need can be used. I thought let's grow food. Cause man, uh, even before that was there's the challenges. Grow food, pea food, grow and that with different animal. Is there a, a reason why you were so keen on growing food? To be honest, I think it was like more get the community together and like bring more people in and like people are like sitting there like relying on food banks and things like that so we thought well maybe like do I don't know how to describe it really like to get them to come in and like accept help we know there's people out there that are really struggling on like day to day basis like or that can't afford to like get a proper meal so like if we had like grew like loads of vegetables and they could maybe like make a soup or something and that would last them for a while. And at least they've got something warm and an actual meal and it would actually fill them. And you said that you're really keen on getting kids play area. Mm-hmm. Is there a reason for that? There's a lot of kids these days that are like just running straight across the road. We don't want that to happen. If they can come to this space it's more secure, it's an open space. Their mums and dads or their granny or parents or guardians can come down. They can lend a hand while the kids play in the play area. And like that's a win-win situation then, because like, the kids are getting a place to play and we're getting more volunteers in, involved. When I say community garden, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Like a phrase or a, a word? People. People as well, really. What do you think has been the biggest challenge for your community group that you've overcome with setting this up or with keeping it going? Get people involved. Get people involved. Volunteers. Volunteers is a big thing right now because we're only running like 78 volunteers in a minute. But we are like advertising every single day to try and get more people involved. We're in contact with the third sector, we're in contact with different community groups as well. Um, NHS, all the people around about us. Um, so our main task is to get more people involved. Otherwise, like we won't be able to keep going. Even if people come down and have a look and say, lend a hand for an hour a day, we're grateful for that because we've all got our own lives as well. We are a volunteer-based group. We're not getting paid for it. We're doing it out of our own kind of a heart. So like more people come involved is what we're wanting. Yeah. to get the garden thriving to where we want it to be. And is there um, a way that you recruited volunteers that worked better than others? We had a lot of people who were interested when we done the big launch in the big park. I think it's that so yeah, it's that was quite focused. My girl was quite focused, she was very hearty. We had a couple of volunteers involved in the very beginning when we had like people that are really involved in art. They loved doing art. So We've done like a couple of workshops with the kids, doing like art workshops with them. Like they get to decorate what they want. Like the planters up the top. The kids done the two this side and the, one of the pair people that done loves doing art. She done the one up beside the gates and then and they decided to paint all the tires different colours, bright the place up. The kids actually love that. So we're looking to do like more workshops with the kids because then the parents and guardians can come down and see what we're actually about. Because we want more people involved, but they won't come unless there's something happening. So events and something mm-hmm. to do with the kids yeah. would be a thing to do. That's a really good tip, actually. Um, 
Is there anything that inspires you, or a person that inspires you? Keep going, do you myself, keep going. That's how, that's how I was fitting well. Now I'm not as fit, but I still keep going. Got a passion for it. Forgotten land, a lot. A passion on forgotten land. Sheila Campbell, she's one of the NHS community development. She's really helped us a lot. So she's helped us with a lot of our ideas, doing like workshops with us, like team training, things like that. So she's really helped us. So she's an inspiration. I help. Well, we'll go to Andy Ferguson. He helped us get the water in. He helped us get the electricity in. A lot of the community councillors have helped us a lot, actually. Uh, like Graham Bell, he's helped us as well. That's yeah. good to have support. Yes. Yeah. What are your local councils, very much, as I say? What are your local agencies? What are your local agencies? It's very important. Mm. Find out who's out there. Work with them. Local businesses. Local businesses. Who can do stuff. Yeah. Networking. That's Aye. good stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I keep hearing that from people. Um, when you think about this community garden, what's the taste that comes to your mind? Potatoes. <laughs> potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> we always grow loads of potatoes, like, cause that's our main vegetable we grow. Cause like we put two beds full of potatoes in each year, so like we always get loads of potatoes, and we're always left with like loads behind, so we just take them all home and like. There's been loads of soup. <laughs> is there a thing that you're most proud of, and what is it? Yeah, space. The space. How have you developed over the years? Not before I started off with, compared to now. We had practically nothing. I always ask everybody to sort of take a trip into the future. Mm -hmm. um, look at the place right now, and then close your eyes and try to imagine what it would be like in 10 years' time and I would mm. like you to bring one memory back and share with us. It'll all been done, hopefully. So like the main part, parts, like the kids' play area, our sensory garden, it'll hopefully all be up and running by then. And then we can pay people. Hopefully it won't take us 10 years. Can you think of a sound um, from that future that you'd hear? Birds chirping, like kids playing in the play area, running about laughing, giggling. Adults coming along, coming to chat or that kind of thing. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a fun place to be. Yeah. Get okay, it, yeah. Sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing um, oh, yeah. your stories. I would like to maybe take a photo, is that okay, of the yeah. two of you somewhere outside? While we were looking for a perfect spot for our photo, Chloe and Paul showed me around the garden. Oh, I can see tatties. <laughs> Brick, raised beds. Is that the first part of the garden that was developed? Yeah. 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 Well, this was the first year. This was the first year I started. Can you tell me about the hill? Um, it is going to be a performance area, a high seating area, so where people can come in during the summer or whenever and like put a performance on like when we're having events. That's where they'll be decorated up there. Um, yeah, and in um, front, that's your picnic lawn, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I, I like the layout of this. <laughs> I, I like you picnics, music. That's what will bring people. Yeah. So who's the gardener? How did you know how to grow things? We don't. We don't. We just guess my things and, like, just Google things and, like, hope for the best, really. <laughs> it's all, like... Where did you go? Where did you go, really? We've got a guy called Gilbert, he loves growing things. It was him that made all like the yellow signs around about the garden, like naming what they are and things like that. Uh, the coffee, the coffee run. He goes around all the community cafes in the place and he collects coffee grounds. Oh wow. So on a Tuesday before he comes to the garden, he goes to YMCA, he goes to, is it Greens? Mrs Greens and Snack. And Snack. Um, and collects all the coffee grounds and he brings them to the garden he puts them in one specific compost bin yeah so it's composting it them yeah yeah, yeah. okay oh. so that should improve the soil yeah. yeah oh that's an interesting project is there any anything that you grew that you were surprised 
cool, ich bin cool. <lacht> ähm, als Schlimmfall ist das ein. Because we weren't sure if we were going to grow this year, but the vast are going to be pretty well. Tomatoes, tomatoes well. Our cool. tomatoes that we've got put in the polytunnel, um, because obviously the soil's not been very great. But like we've improvised and we've learnt from our mistakes to get the soil better for next year. And that's what we can do is like learn from our mistakes and move on really. I couldn't help but be impressed with the way this small group of volunteers took the derelict council caravan site, or as Paul calls it, this forgotten land, into a safe, colourful and productive space for their community in just eight years, and with very, very little resources beyond the power of will and local networks at their disposal. I truly hope they manage to fulfil their ambitions of bringing more people in to have fun, connect and support each other. As Paul wheeled with me back into town over the calm waters of Neath, my mind wandered to the stormy drama that unfolded near the town where I live, in the northeast over that October weekend. Things were settled now and the train started working again so thankfully I could get back home safely after extending my stay. But many people in the area, especially in Brechen, were still dealing with the aftermath of the deluge and would be for a while yet. Such climate change related weather extremes have not stopped coming since last October. In fact, the last 10 months has given us an unbroken and troubling streak of highest recorded land temperatures on Earth. And remember 1.5 degrees? The benchmark set as a target in the International Paris Climate Agreement in order to keep our planet from dangerously overheating. Well, average global temperatures over the past 12 months have now breached that benchmark and they have reached 1.58 degrees above the pre-industrial levels. Just over the last week, I remember hearing news of Scottish farmers not being able to plant their crops which means food will be even more expensive this year. France, Portugal and Spain have been very hot over the last week, which brings a worry about life-threatening summer heat waves. Great Barrier Reef, back in Australia where I come from, is bleaching again because the oceans have been so hot. If it collapses, it will threaten much of the sea life and fish stocks there. It is reported that scientists are a bit worried that we may be entering an uncharted and dangerous territory with climate, which absolutely terrifies me. The climate emergency is definitely here on our doorstep. Are we ready? Have we done enough in Scotland to be able to adapt? What do we need to do to get our communities ready? They're all big questions and I certainly don't have the answers. All I know is that the type of work that I've seen being done by community groups in Dumfries and elsewhere in Scotland is the essential first step to building the resilience required to do both, stop the worst of the climate change from happening and to adapt to its effects in places where we live and love, and maybe to build a better future together. If you'd like to see what the Scottish Government is planning to do about it over the next five years and to comment on the plans, have a look at the draft Scottish National Adaptation Plan. It is open for public consultation until the 24th of April. I will link the Adaptation Scotland article about it, giving it a bit of a context in the show notes. While you're on the Adaptation Scotland website, you can also check out pretty useful adaptation planning resources they have available for communities. That's a wrap for Everyday Changemaker Stories from Dumfries. There are more community climate action stories for you in the pipeline, so check in again soon. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please give it a like and share it with others. It'll really help us reach a wider audience. If something exciting is happening in your own community, be sure to let us know so that we can help you tell your own story. You can drop our story weavers a line at stories at scan.scot. It's scan, S-C-C-A-N, dot scot, S-C-O-T. 
We also offer training and mini-grant support to community storytellers. To keep up to date with our offerings and everything SCAN, check out our website at scan.scot or find us on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram or simply sign up to the newsletter. Music